Warriors legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Welcome, 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 my friend, to another episode of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Brad Wilson. And today I am super pumped up to welcome back a good friend of CPG, the always thoughtful, articulate, and way too wise for his age, Jack Lasky. For Jack, the poker dream all began at the tender age of 12, yes, 12 years old, when most of us were navigating our way through middle school and spending our free time playing video games, Jack and his crew had already entered the online poker streets. Today, he's a founding member of the Just Hands podcast, where he and his co-host, Mr. James Bilderbeck, help their listeners raise up their poker games with bi-weekly drops featuring in-depth hand analysis. Jack's eclectic background and penchant for taking on new challenges has most recently led him to dedicate most of his time managing unbounded capital and investing in bleeding-edge projects in the crypto space. So if crypto is a thing you love learning more about, you're about to be in for a pleasant surprise. In today's greatness bomb dripping conversation with Jack Lasky, you are going to learn exactly what he's been up to over the past year why Jack loves solving for why way more than solving for what, how Jack sees poker fitting into his life, moving into the future, and much, much more. So without any further ado, I bring to you fan favorite, all around amazing dude and longtime friend of CPG, Jack Lasky. Mr. Lasky, welcome back to the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. How you been, sir? Uh, I've been excellent. My podcast output is absolutely pitiful compared to yours. I'm not listening to so many poker podcasts these days. So I, you know, before I jumped on, I was like, who's Brad talk to? And the answer is basically everybody um, and every other day. So I'm extremely impressed. Uh, having been in the podcasting game for probably like five or six years, and I'm just now getting to episode 200. I understand that there's a lot of dedication that goes into this. So round of applause. I think you're going to beat me to 300, no question. I appreciate it, man. And I've mentioned before that my aspiration is daily shows, and it's still there somewhere in the back of my mind. But yeah, it's a lot of, I don't know, we'll we'll just call it stubborn persistence um, <laughs> to release three of these every single week. I, I appreciate the kind words. And, um, yeah, my, my virtual assistant who I'm going to out publicly now, I guess she, uh, I, I hired a virtual assistant to help me out with, um, doing some podcast outreach and just a lot of the things that take up a lot of my energy so that it frees me, frees up my bandwidth to do other stuff. And so I train her, we have, we have a process of like, she identifies herself, says who she is and, you know, asks past guests to come back on and, I did it without giving parameters. Um, I don't think she realized like how much my guests love coming on this show. So she reached out to like 40 people and I'm just looking at my calendar and like over this next week, I have like 11 podcast interviews. I'm like, Oh my God, <laughs> what, what have I done? Um, I could probably go daily like this week if I so chose, but yeah, basically not only have I released a lot of podcasts, I've got a lot in the queue um, right after all of these come out. Well, I want to just say that I love the virtual uh, assistant experience. Definitely, I wouldn't want you spending your time scheduling. It felt, it felt like I was talking to you, even though I was talking to the virtual assistant. Uh, it's just the way it should be. So well done. Good system. Hopefully, I'm not the 11th of eleven. And I'm early in the schedule. I get you fresh. Yeah, you're two of eleven, so I, I'm I'm very fresh. Um, right. And plus, I just really like talking to you, just as a human being. Not that I don't like talking to my other guests. I just particularly enjoy having conversations with you. 
with that said, catch the listener up on what you've been doing over this past year. So we talked, I guess, a year or a little bit more ago. And at that point, I was sort of at the beginning of a transition. And a year and a half later, I'm pretty much fully transitioned, I would say. So a year and a half ago, I was still making most of my money playing poker. Uh, I was working with Berkey and the guys at Solve for Why. Uh, the Academy is in creating content for the Solve for Why site. Uh, I still am, but was much more actively creating my own podcast, Just Hands, and working with coaching clients. Uh, and what was sort of ramping up for me at that time was, you know, I had been working for about a year and a half at that point with a crypto fund, which sort of became exclusively like a Bitcoin SV ecosystem fund. And that has just gone exceedingly well, and it's demanded all my time. And so I had to sort of, well, the the pandemic actually put sort of a natural cadence on, you know, my engagement with Software Y, where they were pretty worried about, hey, are we going to be able to like, you know, continue to do what we thought we were going to be able to do? And I was already sort of like, all right, how am I going to extricate myself from uh, these obligations I have to Berkey and the team? And it ended up just being like a really natural <laughs> kind of point of separation, which, you know, on the one hand is sad and like separating is not always great, but I actually think it all worked out extremely well. And then about six months into the pandemic, uh, we actually started a second business, um, which is like a blockchain infrastructure business, which has sort of transitioned into a Bitcoin gaming uh, company, not gaming like gambling, but gaming like fun games or I mean, gambling games can be very, very fun games, but like uh, video games and other sorts of like puzzle strategy type games. And so that kind of brings me up to the present where, you know, I'm running now a team of, we just onboarded like three people last week. So we're up to like eight or nine people and the fund is growing and I'm playing so little poker. It's ridiculous. Like I'm, I still try and play pretty regularly, if I can, because I just really love the game, but it's, it's impressive. My lack of availability for poker. So I'm really happy to still have just hands as like an outlet to talk strategy, stay involved in the game. I don't do coaching anymore, but I still get to think about poker almost every day. And that I feel like keeps me sharp. Uh, and I got, I got to actually play on a stream a couple of days ago um, in Texas I was, I live in New York, but I was in Texas for some work stuff and my, you know, original co-host at Just Hands started a streamed game in Texas at the Texas Card House in Austin called Poker Unicorns. Concept of the game is basically that it's supposed to be a game where it's as much about the table talk, which is sort of business investor oriented. Um, it's a pretty investor heavy lineup. Like everyone there has to be like an investor or entrepreneur. So I got to play on stream. I felt like I was sharp. Definitely think that just talking about the game kept me sort of, you know, oiled up, ready to make some good decisions. But yeah, I'm playing really little poker these days, Brad. It's kind of weird. And when things kind of get under control, I know just managing nine people, I mean, that's a full-time gig in and of itself. As the pandemic winds down, do you foresee yourself getting into poker or back into poker? Like what's your vision for that? Do you, are you planning on playing just recreationally a few hours a month? Are you planning on playing bigger than you used to just for fun? Um, what, what's the, what's the plan? Yeah. So I've, I'm sort of starting to stumble into this world of private games that I think I'm going to be able to access much more readily because I have this kind of alter ego now. I mean, it's not really an alter ego. It's like, what I'm actually doing, but it's, you know, it's much different to come into a game as someone who either, or let me put it like this. I've been in New York for the past four years or so. And so most of my volume already comes in private games. I've never ever sort of admitted to being a professional in those games. Uh, I just don't think it would serve me very well. And I've always had other things that 
you know, I'm doing on some kind of professional basis that serve as cover. But sometimes it gets a little flimsy where I think people maybe sort of start to kind of put the pieces together. <laughs> um, in well, a you have of- a... Po- a poker podcast for god's sake <laughs> how, I mean, I've, I've how hard could you how good could your cover be i mean i've definitely had people come into games and sort of identify me in that way and normally i like try and kind of pull them aside and say like hey like let's grab a beer after and also you know <laughs> uh you know because a lot of as much as there's a lot of visibility in the poker world like if you have any kind of platform most people don't give a crap and like don't watch anything and aren't engaged at all. Uh, I don't know, especially in these kinds of games. So I do think that well, the crypto world is like obsessed with poker. They love it. They're degenerates. And so it's opened a whole kind of new set of games to me that I'm really looking forward to getting to play more of. I think it actually highlights some of my strengths as a poker player where I always have really loved trying to beat bad players for as much as possible um, and navigating like really silly, like ultra multi-way spots. Like the things that people complain about, like, ah, all these, I'm playing against all these bad players who don't respect my raises. (laughs) I love playing against players who don't respect my raises. (laughs) Same, same. I don't respect my raises. I don't like playing against people that recognize when your range is capped and just go for the three X river shove. And you're sitting there at the top of your range, understanding like, uh Oh, like I've, I've made a mistake somewhere. And now this human being is just basically putting me in the blender. I mean, it's, that's not uh, always a great experience, but like, I think there's a lot of predictability in bad players. There's a lot more than people give it credit for. And yeah, I mean, Pareto principling it out, like 80% of your profit comes from 20% of the players you play against. So my training just in general at chasing poker greatness has been geared towards developing strategies to maximize profit specifically against fish or the weaker players in your pool, because like, That's where most of the earn rate comes from. And that's the only sensible starting point that I could come up with. Yeah, that's actually, so I started just hands uh, with my partner, Zach Resnick uh, back in 2016 or so. And we, I might've mentioned this on the last time I was on your show, but it was a year and a half ago. So I'll just say it again. You know, I was, we were still in college at that point. Zach's a couple years older than I am, but I had just turned 21 and I've been playing poker since I was, you know, 12 or 13 online, but definitely it was sort of not my idea necessarily. It was putting me out of my comfort zone to sort of have the accountability of a podcast. But what we really wanted to do was create a format where we could kind of put that accountability on ourselves to really talk through the maximally exploitive types of strategies Um, that were appropriate in the kind of like one, two, one, three games that we were playing. Uh, And we felt that a lot of the poker content at that time was just a little bit, not too advanced, because that's the wrong word, because you can get very advanced versus different types of player pools. It was just taking kind of a mindset that I think was more appropriate against some types of players uh, and applying it across the board. And we just wanted to find a way of sort of publicizing and also sharpening our mindset against that pool at that time. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, there's precision here and where I'm at now in my research and everything, I'm dealing with data. So it's a lot of mass data analysis and specifically looking at the things that weaker players do and how do you exploit them for the max? Like how do you find the max EV lines in these various situations Uh, How do you realize max full to equity? Data is just an amazing thing because it takes what you believe anecdotally and then it shows you, like, is this belief true? And there are multiple beliefs that, you know, I did a coaching session with my most successful student, John, maybe a month or so ago. And he told me, like, when we were discussing some strategies against some weaker players, he's like, doesn't this go contrary to, like, what you said six months ago? where like when a passive player takes a more aggressive action, that's sort of against their nature and they're likely stronger than usual. 
And I said, yes, that does go against what I said six months ago because I'm learning. Like the data is showing me some assumptions that I made through my own personal experience were just really not true. And it, you can only see that when you take this, you know, super zoomed out way of looking at poker and you see like, oh, I was wrong. I just didn't see it. And there's only one way to really see everything anyway. And that's just call down every hand. And well, who's going to do that? I mean, it's a very expensive way to get, get all of those data points, right? But anyway, mm-hmm. it's a long way of me saying like, I thought poker was supposed to be played one way. I thought that fish in general did or reacted in one way. And the data has just shown me over and over and over again that a lot of these assumptions I made are just not right. And, and that to me is exciting because that represents a possibility for just growing at leaps and bounds. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I have, I have a comment and a question. I'll, I'll start with a question, actually. So I think it can be hard to sort of access data in like a very data form when you're playing or trying to like memorize those sorts of things. I think a lot of like the assumptions that get created are very narrative in form. You know, this player does this because they have this nature and then they experience this thing and they feel this way. Are you trying to kind of convert data into maybe structures that fit better into just like the human brain? Or are you trying to really train your brain to think just in terms of data? I try to train my brain to think in terms of data. People ask me about narrative, like why do players do this all the time? And I tell them, I don't know. Don't think about it. It's not worthy of attaching a story to why they're doing it. I just know the data reflects that they do, and I accept that. And and so really it, it becomes a mathematical equation at that point of just understanding the lines in question and understanding what the data tells me these players are likely to do, the actions they're likely to take, and then making the highest EV decision – at that node in the decision tree. Like that's really basically measuring, weighing, finding the best lines, and then compiling them in such a way that you can study and you can memorize and you can execute. Um, It's very, very tricky. It's honestly, the hardest part of the whole thing is reducing the complexity to make it simple enough to execute. Because I, I think that's the nature of a lot of poker training that exists in the world it's very easy to make things overly complex. If I wanted to create things that were just like super complex and impossible to execute, I would just run a bunch of Pio Sims, screenshot them and say, here you go, do this, do this, right? Like check raise with bottom pair 14% and you're good to go. Um, But that's just not, it's just not good training. It's not good material. It's not something that students and human beings can execute. So yeah, it's basically just looking at it, creating a system, a framework that makes sense and that you can execute in real time. Yeah, it's it's interesting because, you know, when I joined Solve for Why, it was very much like Solve for Why, as in let's focus on the why of why you do things and also the why of why your opponents do things, how those intersect. And the why of our opponents very, very often is going to be some kind of more narrative structure. And so I always really enjoyed trying to take kind of like a probabilistic view of different types of narratives that one might employ. And then what kind of, what does that imply across like multiple streets, multiple runouts? How do you weigh those against each other and sort of try and filter for what are the sort of most important, most probable things as something to actually focus on in game. And over my time in software, why I definitely saw that sort of transition into like software what, which I think is also a broader trend in poker. And I understand why it, it happened for them. And I think it made a lot of sense for that company, but I was always sort of frustrated by it. Cause I'm, I just found the why more interesting than the what is part of it. But I also do think that maybe I'm just a perfectionist, but to me, I would think that because, or at least for the types of opponents that I'm kind of focused on in in my games, in my show, um, who are the more exploitable and 
probably more exploitable because they're more narrative oriented. That if you can try and identify the types of narratives that dominate that thinking, and they'll make clear what a lot of those are just to hear what they tell you, then you can have a more precise form of exploitation. And to me, the va I haven't dug into these sort of massive pool data sets, but what would really excite me about them is the ability to sort of uncover some of the true narratives or try and find narratives that actually fit the data more consistently than maybe what the kind of common wisdom is, um, both in terms of how stronger players, with the wisdom of stronger players in relation to weaker players, and also the wisdom of weaker players in relation like to their own games, the kind of things that people will just tell you at the table. The problem is there's there's multiple problems with the narrative and number one is there's this thing in innovation i believe it's called the i can't remember what it's called but basically there's this thing in innovation where like if you ask somebody what the problem is they oftentimes can't tell you what how they would upgrade a product or what the problem is you have to observe them in action kind of doing it and the story that i always remember is like tide detergent they had some people they they had some people observe a housewife like in the 60s with Tide detergent opening it or whatever, and they saw that she like got a butter knife out of her her uh, kitchen drawer and pried open the cardboard box because it breaks her nails. It was very hard to get into, and they realized, oh, let's just make something that's easy to access so they can just pull it off, and that's just a selling point, right? And I think that like in the same way as it relates to weak players, they don't know a lot of times why they do something. I My suspicion, and it's getting validated pretty regularly at in the live poker streets, which is pretty cool for me. My suspicion is that human beings have a feeling. It's a strong emotion, and they assign a narrative to that feeling to make sense of the emotion. The decisions that they choose stem from the emotion, right? Which means to me that... Weaker players tend to make the same mistakes across the board, across all stake, stakes and times and geolocations, right? Like a beginning player in the U.S. is going to make a lot of the same mistakes as a beginning player in Argentina just because they're a human being and that's their biology. They're constructed in that way. So like for me, the narrative is fairly imprecise in that I don't know exactly what people are thinking. And the data, you know, the data is not going to tell me a story as to why it looks like it looks, right? It's just pure math. So focusing on the emotion that drives the decisions has been a thing that like, it's been my guiding light through this whole project. And it's just turning out more often than not that that's an accurate assumption. I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, it, it's the way that I think about playing cards now. And I, I've just realized that like those narratives that you project onto people, they could be false or they could be true. And a lot of times players do things that like I can't even create a narrative as to why they would do what they do. They just do it. Um, and that's reflected in the data. These somewhat just arbitrary things that human beings do at seeming seemingly random. They do them with regularity and the data just shows you exactly what they're doing and what they're doing it with. Um, but we don't get the why. But I don't, ultimately to me, the why is becoming less and less significant, I guess, over time. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. The why, I think, is is really more of a fascination. The what tends to be what, you know, the thing that's going to make or lose you money. Right. Uh, you'd rather know exactly what than exactly why. Um, or at least if you knew exactly what, it wouldn't matter if you knew exactly why from a dollars and cents perspective. Right. And, and I, I mean, I'm with you, like figuring out the why. I mean, problem solving, this is how poker was played for many, many years. It's, you know, we only had that narrative driven thought to navigate our way and listen to what our opponents are talking about, how they construct their own strategies and then make extrapolating from there as to finding the exploits and the vulnerabilities in the model that they're using while they're playing poker data to me just makes everything more precise. It gives exact precision as to exactly what they're doing, which is like a, yeah, it's been a mind blowing thing. I mean, I haven't played a ton of poker this year because I've been so busy just combing through data and doing my private coaching sessions, obviously releasing three podcasts a week, making courses, writing newsletters, just doing all the things. But my poker game right now is 
sharper than it's ever been. And I'm more confident playing at whatever stakes I want to play online that I'm going to be a 10 BB per hundred winner. And my decision-making is just on point. And I don't think that it's, it's unsurprising to me that despite not playing very much that I would feel more confident than I've ever felt as a poker player because of all this other stuff that I'm doing. Yeah. I'm wondering if you think that the sort of continued distribution and refinement of data oriented playing methods and instruction methods, I think that will have an impact on sort of which, what types of people gravitate towards poker in the first place. Possibly. Probably. What do you think? For me, I would think so. Because I definitely see the value in the data-driven approach. But it doesn't, it doesn't appeal to me. Where that might just be because of like the sort of phase I am in, in my relationship with poker. And I, I think that's most likely the case. Because I'm also in you know, the business of making products. And I take an extraordinarily data-driven approach the product creation and uh, iteration. And so there, you know, it's, it's not just about making money, of course, but, you know, my, my focus is, you know, making money for me and my family, uh, you know, trying to sort of amass generational wealth, essentially. And the best way to do that appears to be taking this data-driven approach. When I play poker these days, my mind is not on how can I amass like generational wealth. It's how can I compete? And I think different forms of competition just appeal to me more than other types of other forms of competition. Where, for example, if I had an answer book in my lap that just told me the best line to take at any time, I could obviously make a lot of money playing poker, but it wouldn't be a very fun, I, I would think. Maybe I guess it, let, I, I don't know. So again, I, I could say that might be true. I don't know. I'm going to show you, I'll show you the latest product that I created after this. It's very, it's very brief and maybe you'll get excited or maybe you won't get excited, but I, I'll show it to you after this. And yeah, I mean, it, it's, and it, yeah, it's, uh, I would say to me as a poker player, it is exciting when you destroy this false assumption that you had historically been making and you recognize that it was incorrect and that the data is actually accurate in real time. And it just upgrades your game at various points in the decision tree. That to me is like super exciting where it's like, okay, I know exactly what to do in this spot um, because I'm studied in this specific area, according to my various line work and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I would say like, for me, like my favorite experiences at the poker table tend to look something like this. And I would say that for what it's worth, when I am in sort of a big decision and I take time to like really think through like what has happened and what the best play is, I really do think I have like an unbelievable success rate. Uh, And I can point to most of my biggest mistakes and say that like, it was like an impulsive decision that I just made without really thinking about what had happened in the hand. It's hard for me to recall times where I took my time and thought through a decision and then had some sort of like massive regret about it. Um, even if I, I'm obviously I've like lost plenty of hands. So I, I'm, I would be curious. I wish I could like look back through all those decisions because um, most of them were not recorded. And so it could be sort of a rationalization, like if I can take the time to like come up with my own rationalization for why I'm going to do it, then I'll just be satisfied with that rationalization and I won't have to like look back and regret it. Whereas if I make an impulsive decision, then I find myself without some kind of rationalization for my action and therefore there's much more room for regret. But I'm... If I'm telling the truth, like in my heart of hearts, I definitely believe that I just have made really, really good decisions for the most part when I've taken time to think about it. I'm wondering when you play sort of with this data-driven approach, 
do you find most spots to be like very obvious without having to put additional thought and really think through the hand and what's happened? So, I mean, it's not like pure, right? It's not like you, you can't ever memorize every spot in the game tree. So you're still relying on logic and problem solving and observing and prioritizing various data points to make your decision. So there's still a a lot of thought that goes into the decisions that are made, but it's more of just having additional clarity in this situation um, that will, that will basically factor into the decision that you make right? Like there, there are plenty of spots that like the data doesn't capture either the data does, does not capture, or it's just really hard to (laughs) memorize every single situation in the game of poker, right? Against various different player profiles and all of that. So basically it just gives you another heuristic to work with when it comes to examining a decision and then going from there. But like there, there are certainly times where a data point that I observe will outweigh the data as a whole because the data point in this specific situation, um, because of metagame or betting patterns or just something is a higher priority than the data as a whole. So yeah, basically it's just another tool in the tool belt. Yeah, that's funny. I'm thinking back to a hand I played on this stream where everyone knew it was the last hand of the stream. And then someone, it was a 5-5 game and someone straddled to $100. Those are the kinds of hand spots that like just really kind of get me going where it's so unorthodox and like you kind of threw out a lot of the the sorts of studyable aspects of poker. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean, of course, right? Like, because I think that people who are constructed like you and I, we want to solve a problem and we believe in our ability to solve the problem. Um, We believe that we are better at it than our opponent. So anytime we have a unique problem that everybody's got to solve all at once, um, I think you and I naturally understand that we have an edge and look forward to those moments of just kind of the chaos where we're going to logic our way through it much better than the opponents that we're playing against. Yeah, that's fun. That's of course, it, of course, it's great. Like it's great playing on, yeah, just operating from that level. I think operating from a high level in anything is just always super fun, rewarding, and this approach to studying poker and everything is just, yeah, it's basically just elevated my game to levels where I just feel confident playing anywhere, anytime. Is that confidence? something that has made poker more rewarding? I would say it makes poker, there's less room for me to question question my decision-making, I think. That's like, I don't agonize over whether or not a call on the river was good or bad when I can quantify whether it was good or bad on my own. And I can say, you know, objectively, it was either good or bad, right? It's like, there's no, should I have done something else? Could I have folded top pair there on the river? It's like, no, you just can't. You just have to call and get shown the bad news sometimes, right? Like that's just, I guess for me, it's more relieving. It, it, it gives clarity to spots that maybe my mind would ruminate on historically. This way I can kind of just let things go much easier. What's like the longest you've sort of stewed on a hand? Uh, in like a regretful or questioning fashion? I don't know. Decades? <laughs> How long have I been playing poker? 17 years? I mean, I- I've got plenty of hands that I just, they get stuck, right? They just get stuck in your mind and you play them back. I mean, I remember I played a 10K event against the only 10K tournament I've ever played because I don't really play tournaments, but I won a satellite in Bluxy one year and I had Kathy Liebert at my table She was on the button, and this is probably 2006, so we're talking 15 years ago. It's not even a hand that, like, I I don't know. It's not something that, like, was devastating results-wise or anything like that. It was just a hand that happened. But, like, she opens the button, and before she opens the button playing live poker, I'm pretty observant in live poker. So, like, I'm watching everybody look at their whole cards. I'm watching what they're doing before it's their action. And she kind of looked at the table and made sure that she was the button made sure that nobody had limped and then she opened the button and I'm in the big blind 
And I'm like, no, 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 Kathy Lieber. You, we don't get to do that. Like, you, <laughs> you're not, you don't get to just raise my button after checking to see if somebody opened. Like, you don't get off that light. So I three better, uh, pretty much in the dark. I, I, I remember she opened and I thought, okay, I'm three betting. So I three bet. I had the, the old Jack nine off. Um, and she called and the flop was like Jack 10, seven. Which I mean, for a jack and a nine, that's about as good as it's going to get, right? I see bet. She piles. And it's like, okay, whatever. I call. And she had kings. And I busted out of the tournament. And I remember thinking about that hand afterwards. Just kind of, I wrote a blog post about it probably like 15 years ago. Just thinking about like the level of detail that Kathy Liebert had to, I don't know if she did it on purpose or if it was an accident. And I was just paying attention to what she was doing, if it was like legitimate. But it, she gave off the impression that, you know, she had a much more marginal hand, a weaker hand to open with there by making sure nobody had opened and making sure nobody had limped. And that's just a thing that kind of stuck with me. I, I replayed that hand multiple times in my head. And every single time I came to the conclusion that Kathy Liebert is just really good at playing poker, I wrote that blog post hilariously, like four people read my blog and Kathy Lieber commented on it like 15 years ago, um, which was kind of unbelievable. It made me, made me think maybe she's like Googling her name. <laughs> like how did she find this random poker blog in the middle of the ether? But yeah, that's a hand that's, that's sort of always stuck in my memory. And I'm sure I have plenty more hands like that. What'd she say? She said she, her comment was, uh, Something in the order of, I wish I could play at that high of a level all the time or something like that. Hmm. It's a little ambiguous. I wonder if that was also intentional to leave you with something ambiguous, a little bit of a post-owning needle, or maybe just a got lucky and this is sort of an aw shucks, like, yeah, if only. I have no idea. I don't know. You know, it's one of those things where like, probably very few people would have even noticed what she was doing, even in a 10 K like they're just not paying that close attention to stuff. So who knows? I mean, I, I can, I just know, I remember what she looked like. I remember the clothes she was wearing. She was wearing this like purple velvet suit thing. Like, I just remember the expression on her face. Like I, I it, it's, and yeah. maybe just totally flawed after 15, you know, it's been 15 years ago. So maybe my memory is faulty, but Regardless, you've got a strong memory of it. I you do. Know, I don't have anything like that. Really, like, in almost any aspect of life. And I I think I'm atypical in in that fashion. I also do think... So, again, I, I want to just be really clear with the audience. Like, I have studied, like, GTO. And I also think that I just... I don't have, like, the time or interest to sort of dive into the data that's available now. But I, if I were playing poker to make money, um, or let me put it like this, if I were a professional still, I would absolutely be incorporating as much of that information in my game as possible. It just, it's a no-brainer. So I, I just want to be clear that what I'm talking about is more about like aesthetics than what's practical. Sure. Um, You've got the luxury of you know, pursuing poker from just like an intellectually stimulating standpoint as sort of, you know, a hobbyist or recreational nowadays, right? Yeah. Uh, I think that'd be a, that's a very fair characterization. What I was going to say is that I definitely saw the kind of commercial pressure with Solve for Why of instilling a sense of certainty in students because people really crave that. And that's that was just a very foreign thing for me because I just don't think I've had issues with nagging uncertainty. It's not to say that I am certain that all my decisions were correct. It's more like I just don't have a memory for it. I was always much worse at remembering hands that I had played like than um, friends of mine uh, and colleagues of mine. I had... I don't think I could tell you any hand that I played in like a main event, for example, with certainty that like I'm getting the details, right. There's maybe like a handful of hands where I can tell you the gist of what happened, but yeah, it just doesn't stick with me. 
And so I think for me, the idea of some kind of knowledge, like giving me that sort of sense of certainty, I think has less appeal than it does for most people. And so I've, I've always resisted both the sort of GTO phase. The GTO thing I just think is not actually that effective the way most people employ it. The data-driven thing I think rationally I, I expect it to be much more effective. Empirically, it seems to be much more effective. Uh, and so this one, I would say I'm resisting a little bit more just based on aesthetics than anything, uh, most likely to my long-term detriment as a poker player, but whatever. <laughs> but that's not, that's not your priority, right? So, Yeah, and it, it may become my priority again if I, if I find myself like in very high-stakes environments um, where the money is meaningful again then I, I think I would strongly consider uh, diving back into that. But right now, most of the games I'm playing, like the money is just not that meaningful in part because I haven't networked very much in quarantine to try and get into higher stakes games. And my sort of just, I guess, net worth has gone way up. I mean, I don't know if that's like a not humble or not cool thing to say. But I mean, it, the, the truth, the truth is the truth, right? Like if it's been a good year, which I'm sure for a lot of people in the crypto space, it's been a pretty damn good year, right? Yeah. I mean, part of it is like the sort of deceptiveness of sort of startup oriented net worth. Like if you start a company, raise some money at a certain valuation, like your paper net worth goes way up. And so like, I've probably over adjusted based on both like the EV of that net worth in terms of like future liquidity as well as present liquidity. But emotionally, it's just what it is. Like, you know, the money just doesn't feel as big uh, as it once did. Well, that's not the worst thing to happen in life, Mr. Lasky. It's a, it's a good place to be. And that's a place that I think at least, you know, I aspire to be in where, yeah, like the ins and outs of the daily grind is can be fun and stimulating and rewarding, but ultimately a bad day is not something to lose sleep over, right? A hundred percent. I mean, I think that's something that probably all professionals strive for anyways. And definitely as a professional, like most of my professional years, I was very young and didn't care that much about going broke. I didn't really go broke, but... I was playing a sort of bankroll management practice that easily could have resulted in that. And so the losses definitely stung. So I, I don't miss that. But I also think that had I stayed the course, it would have been with an emphasis on sort of avoiding that kind of thing in the future. Because it's something that I understood was unsustainable, even if I didn't care enough to change it at the moment. Well, it's a lesson in poker. You've got to learn one way or the other, right? Like I think that people with a net worth of a billion dollars, losses still sting to them. Even if it's insignificant to their net worth, they still hate losing and they still have to learn how to deal with that just through the world of poker. Poker is like, it's one of those things that forges people. Like it tests your emotions. It, it tests you. You have to learn. Um, you have to be resilient. So like, one way or the other, I think it's probably better to just learn that when you're young so that you don't have to learn it when you're older and it may be harder to correct. Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't think hating to lose is that bad of a life lesson uh, or sorry, a, that bad of a quality. But I think what's really important is understanding what is a loss, what is a win. And obviously in poker, losing money doesn't mean necessarily that like it's not the same as other types of losses so you have to kind of you have to transform that hatred of losing into something that is more of a practical instinct for the realities of like a world that's just chock full of variants in a world where a fish dog bets the flop and you don't know what to do one man, Coach Brad Wilson, has a surefire plan to neutralize flop leads and rip that dunk 
to shreds. Nuffle. Available now. Go to chasingpokergreatness.com slash nuffle. Rated R. So, John, you've used neutralized flop leads in the past 24 hours, correct? Yeah, so I got the basically the slide with all the info on it on Friday evening, and yesterday I played a session of uh, 1KNL on Ignition and played one particular pot that I remember where a fish just donks flop turn river into me, and I ended up winning with a hand that I would have folded before looking at the slide, but I ended up winning like a $400 pot instead, and the course is $99, so <laughs> definitely paid for itself very, very quickly, and I think that'll be the case for even people that aren't playing as big as 510 No Limit. Like, I think this is a course that will very, very quickly pay for itself given how how much more donking there is at lower stakes. And I think one of the most common questions I see asked in the Greatness Village Slack group is, what do donks mean? How do I deal with donk bets? I, I think that's got to be like in the top three most frequently asked questions. You, you ought to feel very excited when somebody donks into you because some good things are about to happen. You said like you probably don't need anyone to teach the course or like you can just look at the slide and, and learn all the info yourself. I feel like you, Brad, will have to be there because I am I am almost sure, sure that anybody who looks at the slide won't believe it looking at what they're supposed to do and will have to confirm with you that like you didn't make a massive typo somewhere and that this is actually what they're supposed to do because it's pretty shocking the optimal way to deal with fish donking into you on the flop is. If you'd like to check out Neutralize Flop Leads so that you're never again confused when a fish leads into you in a single race pot, head to chasingpokergreatness.com slash nuffle. That's chasingpokergreatness.com slash N-U-F-F-L-E. And now, back to the show. We, we did a hand at Poker Power Hour about a week ago where it's something that I, I've thought about many, many times in my poker career, but I think it was one of the first times I verbalized it in like a group setting where um, a very strong player in the group played a hand where the flop was like queen four deuce. They opened from the small blind, the big blind defended and the big blind is like some kind of reg. Uh, so queen four deuce rainbow small blind strong player bets ace tray of clubs. So gut shot with backdoor and up flush draw the big blind raises and Strong player bet three bets the flop, right? So we talked about that decision of choosing to bet three bet there because, you know, theoretically, the big blind should be raising a lot of like middle pairs, bottom pairs, some top pairs. They should be pretty wide. And so we need to have some bet three bet bluffs in our range. Ace tray of clubs kind of fits the bill there because you know, if we have outs to the nuts. There's not a ton of draws available, et cetera, et cetera. So the big blind calls, it turns a four. So it paired the board, queen, four, four, deuce. And we talked about next plan of action. My thought was basically go small again, um, like 30% pot on the turn, set up a river jam because your hand doesn't need a lot of protection or your value doesn't need a lot of protection there. So yeah, so my student, strong player, went small in game. And then the river was a five. So the river, he rivers the wheel. And in game he decided to jam for like a 92% pot size river bet and the opponent folded, right? And because it was played on ignition, we can see 24 hours after the fact what they folded, they folded queen jack, right? And the thing that I verbalized was that in game, when these spots happen while I'm playing, I actually feel bad when villain snaps river with queen jack because I, because if villain snaps river with queen jack, my plan was foobar from the jump because those are the hands that I'm targeting. And a much more likely outcome is that I don't realize equity and that I jam the river as a bluff. And like if villain is just calling with queen jack, then I'm just torching money, right? So like actually, even though he hits the miracle and shoves for value on the river, I would feel worse if villain calls with top pair than if villain folded top pair, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So do you think Shove was right? No. And that was another thing that we talked about because 
uh, basically, ultimately, the conclusion that we came to was just go max exploit there and have two different sizes. That one that gets called by Queen Jack and the other that does its best to fold out Queen Jack in an anonymous pool. So like going 33% when you improve and just jamming when you don't is like the the max exploit approach. Yeah. I love it. I love consistency. I think it's a good line. No, it, Yeah, it, it's a good line, but it's just like I've been trained over the years to just kind of think in those terms of like I made my hand, but – Ultimately, that's not what matters. What matters was my plan to bet three bet, bet small jam. And if like that's getting snapped off by a top pair, my plan is just not good. And that's makes me feel bad. Yeah. You're working at, you know, it's an impressive not jam for a couple of reasons, because I think you're working against kind of two dogmas, which is like one, if I'm shoving bluffs, I should shove value, which that one is a little bit easier to debunk um, because it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but <laughs> the other one, which I think is more just like this sort of weird obsession with symmetry is we have like a pot size bet. So like, what are we going to bet? 35% and then leave like this like little dangler behind. Um, that, that doesn't feel, it's not satisfying. That's not like what it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to have the the sort of consistency of mind to just identify that like this was a bluff that no longer is a bluff the plan was around bluffing I'm no longer bluffing therefore not only is it likely that I need a different plan but it's very likely that the plan that I had is a bad plan and then deviating yeah for sure I mean we play poker to get money right I think that's the goal. And so, especially if you're playing against weak players that don't understand the exploits that you're making, you just would be kind of a fool to not have various bet sizings to accomplish different goals based on the equity of your hand at the river. You know, we were talking about kind of trying to reframe like what's a win, what's a loss. It's something that I've actually... You know, I've talked a lot throughout my career as like a poker podcaster and especially in the last couple of years, I've also been an investor and talking about, you know, the lessons of poker, the translate well to investing, yada, yada, yada. Everyone's heard that before, um, you know, and it's obvious why. So I'm not even going to talk about that because it's, I'm sure your audience just knows. So what I've actually started to observe is the overtraining of poker for situations that are a little bit less like the game tree in investing is way bigger than in poker. Um, and a lot of the assumptions we make in investing, I think are, they can be harder to actually assess empirically. And it's just the nature of like what it would take to assess something empirically. Um, even if you could do it, it might not be worth the money to do it. And I think that I've definitely noticed my poker training can start to actually encumber me a little bit where I'm always right based on like the assumptions I had. And sometimes those assumptions can't be tested. And so you're stuck in this place where you can't make a mistake and you've trained yourself emotionally to be detached from some kind of negative outcome. And then it's sort of like, how do you move forward? How do you actually, you don't know if your assumptions are right. You know that you're not necessarily either making as much money as you should or you're losing money in whatever result happened. Yet you've emotionally trained yourself to accept that you can have the right process and not win. So how do you, how do you take the next step? Oh, this is easy. This is an easy question. Um, this is an easy question to answer. And that is to get an outside perspective from somebody that's operating at a high level. You know, the way that I do my private coaching sessions specifically are make a, make a play and explain video recording, um, verbalizing their thought process, my students thought process in the moment, the options they're considering, the data points they're observing and prioritizing, and then training based on that video that they send me. So basically the answer is to 
hire someone that also thinks about poker at a high level and can give you insights into your blind spots. Because otherwise, you know, most of the, what, what's funny is I don't do a lot of live poker coaching because most of the gold in my private coaching sessions come from spots where the student has no awareness they're making a mistake. They would never bring me th that hand they played on their own because they assume they know what's going on and they assume that they played it well. So there's no like struggle, right? That's where the real gold is in these private coaching sessions is like identifying blind spots and questioning and testing assumptions that they're making. And that's really the only way to get out of your own head is to find a private coach that you trust that can give you a different perspective or, you know, find a colleague or somebody that's also in the industry, a friend that you trust to, to give feedback. No, agreed. I think, uh, what can happen, this is part of what's really nice about poker. And it's like a training ground is that it's fairly standard and it's easy to sort of, I mean, it's not trivial, but it's often very feasible to get someone who can really examine your assumptions quickly and give you a good challenge those assumptions based on similar experiences um, or based on something like data. Yeah. When in the investing world, you can get a lot of times you want to be investing in something that is very poorly understood by most people. Uh, Same in poker, right? You want to play games that are poorly understood by most people. Yeah, no, that's true. So if you're, um, like if you invent a game and you're playing with your friends uh, and then you go and you ask someone like, hey, like, here are my assumptions about how people will play in this spot. And so based on my assumptions, I did the right thing. Do you think my assumptions were right? And they're like, I never even played this game. <laughs> right. Now pay me. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it can be, it's something that has been challenging where I see actually a lot of investors who are successful and don't don't have the same kind of like emotional discipline and don't have the sort of poker training, which I think is in most cases an asset. But it's been interesting for me to try and study like how the how other people who don't have like the same kind of training approach these situations. Um, like some a lot of people in the investing world are just like absolutely allergic to losing money. Like, mm. And I, th I think the biggest mistake they make there is like the risk of like majorly compounding losses in some kind of like asymmetric downside scenario. But on the other hand, they are training themselves to sort of seek types of edges that I'm probably not going to end up ever looking into because I'm just more comfortable with a loss because I understand it to be part of the game essentially well yeah and it's the feedback is not always accurate right like that that's the that's the thing like that's why poker is such a beautiful game is like the feedback mechanism is distorted where just because you win a hand does not mean you played a hand well just because you make a value bet on the river does not mean you chose the optimal value bet sizing right like there's always this question of like can i improve you know, and what can I do to improve? And with that just comes, yeah, sometimes things don't work out and that's just the reality of life. And it's kind of just baked into, I think most poker players thought process or the way that they live their life is like, you do your best to make good decisions given all the information that you know, and then the chips fall where they may. Like sometimes it, it doesn't work out. And I have to imagine that like in the investing world, that's something that probably should happen quite frequently, right? In the same way that we lose hands quite fre frequently in poker, sometimes things don't go well and you just get out of the position, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. On the other hand, it's, it can be harder to quantify. Like in poker, you can say, I think my opponent has this range. Sure. This yeah. range, I lose and I win this often. So if I lose... I signed up for this. Um, and then sometimes there's that parallels well to the investing world where I'm looking for these types of things to happen. 
but then there can be a question of like if it if something does or doesn't happen, was that actually knowable? Like in and the, the same thing comes up in poker, but I think that the universe of like available information and the kind of time available to make decisions is such that we kind of relieve ourselves of like the ability to, or the sort of necessity to answer that kind of question in large part in modern poker circles. Like, I don't think you'll hear that many people saying something like you, like we know that someone's looking down at four, six suited versus ace four suited, that they're going to have like a slightly different nose wrinkle. <laughs> right. And you should have picked up on that. Sure. Like, no one's holding each other to that kind of, standard even if like hypothetically those sorts of differentiations and that ability to gain that level of transparency exists but i think or for me i think it's hard to know like what standard of detail sort of hold myself to as an investor uh, in these in these sort of spots um, where there's uncertainty and there's assumptions and potentially like events and should i have known is it's a part of the assumption that it's really hard to make a determination, especially because there's a cost to learning in the same way that there's a cost to tanking. Like if you tank for 10 minutes, if you're, you know, if you're like a 10 bigs per hour player and you tank for 10 minutes over like a half big blind sort of EV spot, you just lost money. People don't think of it like that. Um, Cause it doesn't really come up that often in poker. Certainly, you can discover information in the investing world at a cost, but a cost that might not be justified based on not only the investment itself, but also like your personal EV as a fund manager, which it's a whole sort of conflict of interest that's uh, sort of inseparable from the art. So it's a tough game. It, uh, it's yeah. treated me well, but it's... Yeah, it sounds like sounds like you got to trust yourself, right? Um, I do have a template for these these round twos that we didn't even touch, which I'm actually grateful for because I want more material to have you on in the future again because I always enjoy connecting and catching up with you and what you're doing. Um, hopefully, the next time, maybe you'll have put in some some volume. You'll be more more alive in the poker streets than over this this past year do you think that's going to be the case as you know the pandemic winds down no no <laughs> uh, so but I, I have i have other things i can offer you know if you drop the poker and just chasing greatness you know we can wrap on that yeah uh, i mean honestly it poker is just a cover to have interesting conversations with people who i respect and value so you know doesn't always have to be about poker and i'm sure that the listener always enjoys hearing from you as well. And I, I think there was actually a fair amount of poker in here. So it's very pokery, very pokery, more pokery than yeah. More, more pokery than maybe you thought it might be. I don't know. It is the chasing poker greatness podcast. So I, I was prepared for some poker. Yeah. That's probably a good assumption. I, studied, I looked at my, I studied my ranges before I jumped on, you know? All right. So what's, what's your, what's four bet from UTG facing MP three bet four bet bluff range jack uh first i look him in the eye look right into his soul and make a determination and it's either zero or a hundred okay perfect that's that's the perfect answer for the podcast and uh we'll end on that very precise um way to analyze poker hands in uh the listener's poker journey look them in the eye read their soul and then just make the perfect decision every time it's easy no guarantee it's easy but it is effective <laughs> um so to close you'll know up if you get it right because you'll be winning money yeah you'll know that if you get it right because if you get it wrong you'll be broke over and over and over and over again so a couple questions here and we'll wrap up uh what's a project that you're working on currently that's near and dear to your heart could be a passion project or something recreational just something meaningful to you so definitely the thing that has sort of like been an obsession of mine uh, for a while now is like NFT based gaming. And I didn't really anticipate like an NFT bubble like we've seen so soon. 
So it was actually on my company's roadmap and we pushed it way up. So I've gotten to like sink my teeth into it much sooner than expected. Uh, but yeah, that's what we're working on. I mean, that's sort of, I don't have like, a huge amount of time for like, a passion type project, but I'm definitely really passionate about what we're doing at my company, Embedded Enterprise. So we created this platform called Nifty Jigs. And Nifty Jigs is basically a way of creating a network around a shared set of NFTs for creating all kinds of different games and applications. And we're building a game called Hash War uh, as sort of the first uh, game built upon Nifty Jigs. Um, and it's similar to Magic the Gathering, but way cooler. Well, that that's a good um, description there. For, for the listener who may not know what NFTs are, could you explain a little bit so that they can understand? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, an NFT, the acronym stands for non-fungible token, but I think a better way of thinking about it is just unique digital properties, typically with the ownership defined on a blockchain. So what we've created are essentially unique digital properties that can be repurposed in different kinds of games and applications. So if you own one of these, then you own kind of a set of, not literally infinite, but infinite possibilities in all kinds of different games currently being created and yet to be created. Perfect. And so basically you own a thing and the rights to that thing are kept on the blockchain so in some cases, I've seen that there's like uh, basically NFTs for like digital horse racing, right? Where you own a specific horse um, and then you can resell that horse. You can put it into virtual races and basically just gamifying and assigning property through the use of these tokens, right? Yeah, I mean, for us, like... And this kind of gets to like some differences between like our approach to blockchain and I think some other companies. So, like we don't use Ethereum because Ethereum is crazy expensive. It's like sometimes five figures to create an NFT, and then very often, you know, fifty to hundred bucks to transact with an NFT and send it to somebody else. So we're on Bitcoin SV, so these are incredibly low. It's like one one hundredth of a cent for a transaction, costs us less than a cent to create an NFT. And so for us, it's just a really practical way of tracking ownership. You know, you could do what we're doing through sort of like traditional ways of storing data and securing rights around data, but the blockchain is just really efficient and convenient for us. And so that's why we're using, you know, blockchain-based NFTs. But yeah, these are things that... Um, you know, someone could create a horse racing game around what we've built. And if you had a really good horse, then maybe your jig would become more valuable and you could sell it to somebody else. Uh, no promises. <laughs> cool, man. Well, thank you very much for your time and your energy. I, I do promise that we'll do this again sometime in the near future. And final question here, if the listener in the audience wants to learn more, about Mr. Jackson Lasky, where can they go? Uh, Ecclesiastes. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I would say at Jackson Lasky on Twitter is probably the best place. Um, for If you want to hear me talk about poker, um, Just Hands Poker is the place to go. We have our 200th episode coming out. I hope it'll probably be out by the time this episode is released, is my guess. And if you want to learn more about uh, my investing life, unboundedcapital.com. And if you want to learn more about the kinds of games and those sorts of things I'm building, then I would go to unboundedenterprise.io. So I know that's uh, quite a few destinations, but hey, you asked the question. I did ask the question, and all of that will be in the show page. So easy place. Stop by the show page of this episode on ChasingPokerGreatness.com and then you can click through from there with, to all of those links. Be sure to check out the Just Hands Poker Podcast. If you enjoy Tactical Tuesday with me and John, then there's 200 Tactical Tuesday-esque episodes of Just Hands Poker ready for you to dive right into. 
thank you for coming on, man. It's been great. I really enjoyed it. Let's talk soon. Thanks, Brad, and congrats on the success with the podcast. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker Greatness. If you have yet to subscribe to the show, please take a second to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be. For more content from me, Coach Brad, please visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash enhance your edge, and I'll see you next time.